Welcome to another video from explainingcomputers.com. This time I'm going to return to my Raspberry Pi robotics project and specifically I'm going to be taking this Zumo robot chassis, I'm going to mount on it a Raspberry Pi Zero, a motor controller and some batteries, I'm going to end up driving the thing around using this Rai i8 wireless keyboard. Right, let's start off looking at the uh, components we're going to use to build our uh, Raspberry Pi robot. And the Pi I'm going to use is going to be this, which is a Raspberry Pi Zero, here in a Pi Maroni case. It doesn't have to be, but this one happens to be. Last time I was doing this project, I was working with a Raspberry Pi Model 1, uh, Model B, here, here we are. But I've now moved on to the Pi Zero, because it's a bit smaller, we'll use a bit less power. But you could use any Raspberry Pi you like to do what I'm going to show you here. To have the Pi independent, it will need its own power supply. I'm going to run it from this, which is a standard USB power bank. You can pick these up for a few pounds, a few dollars these days. This, I think, is a 300 milliamp power bank. This will run a Pi Zero for many, many hours. Got a little light to come on at the end there. If we turn it off again, it'll hopefully light to go off. Yes, they do. A little, little lovely sequence there. That, of course, connects in via a standard USB lead. We've also got our Zumo robot. This I put together in my last Raspberry Pi robotics video. You basically buy this as a kit. You buy whichever micro motors you want and you sold your wires onto the motors. And then we can use that to build on top of, as we will in a second. To power that, I'm initially going to be using some batteries in a uh, little, little container like this, a little, little battery clip. But eventually the batteries will end up in a compartment. There we are on the, in the base of the robot. So we'll be doing that a bit later on. To do that, I'll need to fit these parts, which I didn't use in my last Raspberry Pi robotics video. These are the battery clips, which will be used fitted into here at some point during this video. Finally here, as you probably noticed, we have this thing. This is the most critical thing in many respects. This is the motor controller. This is an L298N. What this does is allows the GPIO pins on the Raspberry Pi to control a motor. And you might be thinking, well, why do we need a motor controller? Well, it's because a Raspberry Pi cannot supply enough power to power a motor. If you connect a motor directly to GPIO pins, you'll simply blow up your Raspberry Pi. But also the motor controller takes care of things such that you can have one GPIO pin to run a motor forwards, another pin will run it backwards, etc. So it makes controlling a motor very easy. So these are the basic things we'll use in our build. We'll also need various wires and things, and I'm sure various bits of screws and bits of plastic. I can't tell you exactly what those will be yet, because I haven't so far figured it out. Right, I've now got things wired up pretty much as I had them at the end of my last Raspberry Pi robotics video, so I'll just let you know what's going on here. We've got the, uh, the Pi Zero, which is connected to HDMI for, for a monitor, so we can see what I'm doing when we do the coding in a second, and it's connected up to the EZAC USB bank as the, as the power supply. We can turn the Pi on by pressing this button, as I'll be doing in a second. We've also got the uh, Pi Zero connected to an adapter for uh, USB, just the one USB port. We will be connecting the uh, dongle for the Rai keyboard into this so we can control this whole thing with the, uh, the Rai later on. But for now, I'm going to connect it to uh, this thing, which is a Broadcom device. Looks a bit like a highlighted pen. It isn't. You take the top off, you discover there's a USB port there, USB jack, and we can now connect this to two USB devices. This is a USB hub, but it's also, although we don't need it here, a Wi-Fi adapter. It's a fantastic uh, a thing to use with the, the Pi Zero. So anyway, that'll allow us to use a normal keyboard and mouse while we do the, the basic programming. We've also here got the motor controller, the L298N, which is connected to the Pi via four of its GPIO pins. And if we look on the wiring diagram, you can see more clearly what's going on there. We've basically got the Pi connected across so we can control the two motors connected on motor A and motor B on the diagram. And what will happen here is that pin 7 will turn motor A forwards, pin 11 will turn it backwards, pin 13 will turn motor B forwards, pin 15 will turn it backwards. You'll see here that uh, the power pins on the motor control device, the l 298 n have got 12 volt labelled there. You don't need 12 volt power, that simply means this unit can handle up to 12 volts. So this is connected through to uh, our, our battery pack, as you can see here, which is also connected to the, the middle terminal, the ground terminal for powering the module. And if we connect the batteries in, you'll see that will actually power things that you might just about see with a little light coming on there. You might not see that light 
Can you see a little light? Don't think you can, it's hidden. Yeah, anyway, there's a little light coming on there, just about when we connect the battery pack. But we'll leave it disconnected for now. It's also worth pointing out that on these boards, the L298Ns come in different varieties. Some of them have what I've got here, which is a tiny little jumper, and this jumper is a 5 volt enable, which means in practical terms the board can be powered by the battery pack, by the batteries we'll be using to, to run the board and to run the motors. So because I've got that enabled, I haven't had to connect anything to the 5 volt line here on the 2 and then connecting it to the Pi. If I hadn't got that enabled, or if I'd taken that jumper off, I would have to connect this pin here across to 5 volts from the Pi. You can see more about that on, on the web page I put up accompanying this project, but it matters depending on how you configure the, uh, the motor controller. Finally here, as you can see, we've got the Zumo chassis itself. This is connected in currently by a very long set of wires as we used in the last video, so we could take it a long distance to the, the pins on, on the motor controller. So there's our basic setup, pretty much as we had it before, but we now want to do some programming so we can control this thing via a keyboard, and then we'll take all this stuff, mount it across on here, and also I'll exchange this battery pack to use the battery whole battery cover, which is actually in the bottom of this unit. So we will use batteries on the unit itself a bit later on. I've also got this just raised up for now so we can run the thing without having to have it running back and forth so we can test things out. So, I'm now going to boot the thing up. Another thing I'm going to point out before I do that though, is many people have said to me following the last video, if they connect their power to their uh, motor controllers, we'll, we'll do there, and then we boot the Pi up, the motors might start going. That may or not happen here, I don't know, it's random, let's see. They do. One of the motors has started spinning. Why is that, you cry? Well, if you think about it, it should be obvious. What's happened, I'll disconnect that for now, I can get it off, there we are, is that when you're booting up the Pi, the GPIO pins haven't been programmed yet. They don't know what state they're in. They don't know if they've been told to be an input or an output, or whether they're a high or low. Therefore, it's not surprising that when you're booting up the Pi, before you've enabled the GPIO function and set, sets it to a clean state, that the motors would run. So you want to make sure you don't connect your power to your motors before the Pi's had a chance to run some GPIO code. And therefore, on our final robot, I'll be putting a switch in to enable us to control that. Right, with our Pi now booted up, I've gone into the idle editor to write some Python code. Now, you can write your Python code in any editor you want. You can use things like the nano editor in the terminal. I'm using idle here because it allows me to use different curls on screen, show you nice big fonts for a video. And what we're going to do is, first of all, look at some code which basically reads key presses and then sends some words to the screen so we can see it's working properly. And then when we've got that working, we'll apply the same principle to control our motors on the Zumo robot. Now, there's various ways you can read the keyboard for this purpose in Python on, on a Raspberry Pi, one of which is the, the curses method. So here, the first thing I'm doing in the code is to load in the curses module. And curses is basically a terminal-based keyboard and screen handling module in Python, and I'm going to say no more than that. But once we've actually got it imported, we need to set it up for our purposes, and we've therefore got those four lines of code here, which basically, as the comments say, turn off echoing so we don't see keystrokes appearing on the screen all the time while we're doing this. Uh, they make sure it'll uh, not be waiting for a key response, it'll keep going on and checking when we need responses, and it'll turn on special values for cursor keys. You don't worry about too much about that, that's just code you've got to put in. Compared to other methods for reading the keyboard in Python, this is actually a nice straightforward piece of code. We then got going down below this, we've got a try finally loop, going all the way from there to there. Try and finally is a structure it's set up so it'll try to do the first bit of a loop up here, and then if it can't do that, it'll always execute the finally bit at the bottom. That's really important because if you're using curses, you're turning off parts of terminal functionality to make it work for us, we must turn them on again at the end. And therefore it's important we always execute these two bits of code at the end of something if we're using curses to read the keyboard. And having it in the finally statement will make that happen. We then, of course, have got the rest of the code here. If we just go and highlight the, uh, the while loop in the middle. This is a while loop which starts off with the command while true. And while true basically says to us, uh, run this loop forever. Because while runs, as long as the following condition is true, the command true is obviously is always true. 
We then are going to uh, read a character. We're going to set up a variable here called car, and we're going to pick it up from curses to actually get a value from the keyboard for car. We're then going to say if car equals an ordinary um, Q, for some reason my highlighting stopped working properly there, let's go back to it that way. If it equals an ordinary Q, in other words, it is simply the Q character on the keyboard, then this program will break and execute our finally command. We've got to have a way of getting out of this. We then got a set of commands, as you can see, which do what you might expect. They actually look to see if car is the value key up, key down, key right, key left, and they print up, down, right or left. And then finally, because one of the problems with Curtis is it doesn't tell you how long a key is pressed for, it only tells you the last key it's pressed, so once you release a key, the cursed value doesn't change. To control our robot, we're going to have to have a means of going left, right, up and down, but also of stopping it. So the final command here says, car, if car equals 10, which is the value for the enter key, then it'll print stop. And uh, on our um, right unit, in the middle of the cursor arrows, there is an OK button, which is also an enter key, which therefore will read to a value of 10. So that's the basic code. If we go over here to a terminal, because we're using cursors, you must run this code in the terminal. And I'll just do a directory to see where we are. Well, we're in the root because I've just run the terminal. I need to change the directory to be in where the code is, which is Python and code is what I've called my code directory. You might have called it something else, of course. And I now need to run the curses code here we've got, which is just up here. So I'm going to type um, Python. We could make this executable. I won't bother with the, what we're doing here. It's fairly simple. And so Python, to tell us it's Python code, curses um, key test. I should have given it a shorter name, shouldn't I? Never mind. Pi on the end, because it is curses key pi. Run that. The screen will go black, because we've turned everything off. But if I now press, say, the up arrow, it'll print up. Down will print down. Left will print left right, etc. We can go on doing this for hours. We can also generate a stop pressing enter. Once we're happy that works, which it does, we'll press Q to come out of that. So that's given us some basic code which allows us to read the keyboard in Python. So I've now booted up again, but this time I've booted up with the wireless dongle connected to the Pi, so I'm now actually running it from the, uh, the Rye wireless keyboard. As a very important thing to say, do not try switching to this wireless keyboard um, when the Pi is running, because every time you put this dongle in, it resets the Pi, at least it does for me. I've learned the hard way that you must switch your keyboards before you boot. Anyway, it is now running, and if we look at the screen, I've got some more code here. So uh, what we've got is basically the same code as before with a few additions to it. So we're still importing the Curses module, but also here we're importing um, the GPIO module as GPIO. We're then going to set up GPIO just as I did in my uh, second Raspberry Pi robotics video. So we're setting the board numbering, and we're setting pins 7, 11, 13, and 15 to be outputs. We're then doing the same Curses thing we did before, which is just the same code as the last segment only added to. And then we've got, once again, a try finally loop that I'm just Wandering around the screen. Let me back to the top, you little swine. There we are. Anyway, so we've got a try finally loop. Again, um, same start to it, while true, um, checks for a, for a break and that sort of stuff at the top, which is exactly the same as we had previously. But now, rather than just printing something to the screen, our next statement, our next else if statement says, um, if we've got key up, we're going to configure the outputs of a GPIO pin. So basically, we're going to turn both motors forwards if key is up. And then we'll do the same thing again if key is down to send them backwards. Obviously, which way around these appear depend on how you have your motor wires connected. We're then going to spin the thing in each direction on the keys left and right so we can turn. So we basically have reverse logic again. One motor goes forward, one goes backwards, and then the other way around, um, finally down there, if I can highlight it all correctly. I don't have to highlight it all correctly. It just makes me feel better if we do it. Finally, again, we will pick up the, uh, the stop, which is the enter key, and if that's selected, then we turn all the GPIO pins off and stop all the motors. We then run finally on the end, and everything runs fine. So if we flick over to our uh, terminal, and uh, just to save a bit of time, I've already typed the command in, so we'll run the command by pressing enter on our, our thing, and the key keyboard will go clear. And I'll now go back to the Pi itself, and I'll connect our um, power to the motor unit, and then in theory, I'll bring the wireless thing in onto the screen so you can see that as well. And if I press these buttons, 
Well, look, motors forwards, motors backwards, backwards, forwards, backwards. OK to stop them. Spin one way, spin the other way, stop. Strange way to drive, I know with a stop in the middle, but it does work. Backwards, forwards, spin one way, spin the other, and stop. So I think we've proved the software principle now. We now need to take all of this kit, put it all together into one autonomous robot. Right, I've now stripped things down. So we've got the uh, Zubo unit down to its, its basics. But as you can see, I've added some wiring because I've now got the batteries in the base of this unit. I put in the battery clips, take that back on there. And I've also had my soldering iron out and I've been soldering on the, uh, the leads, the battery clips, and I've also added this switch into the circuit so the power will come from here and from here into the uh, L98 motor controller. So the idea is now is it looks something like this. The battery goes on something like that. The uh, Pi goes on the back something like that. And the controller goes something like that. And it all gets wired up. And if you're thinking, how do I make that work? Well, what I've done, I've taken a piece of plastic card. You can buy this for a few pounds, a few dollars a sheet um, for somewhere like Amazon and craft shops, things like that. And you can take a Stanley knife or another sharp knife and you can score plastic card using a good hard edge, ideally a metal ruler. And if you keep scoring it, get a good deep score, you can then take the card and very carefully snap it and you get a nice clean edge. And that allows you to make plastic card pieces. I've also drilled them as, as necessary. And if we just uh, get rid of these for a second, you'll see I've now got a plastic card piece which will go on, on the base of here. It'll sit there something like that with the battery then on top like that. I've got a couple of side pieces. It'll go in something like this. And I've got a top piece which will go in here. Which way does that go? It goes like that, I think. And when the pie goes on the back and the thing goes there and the switch mounts in here and it'll all be marvellous. So we now need to start putting all of this together. So I think the first thing I'll do is to get rid of the, uh, the Zumo. We need to take these uh, plastic parts and we need to put them together. We can do that using this stuff, which is a uh, liquid adhesive. We can do effectively uh, solvent welds on, on the plastic art. So I'll get on with that. And uh, there we are. I think we've got a nice, nice solid uh, plastic mounting unit. They've built a little chassis there. So we now need to get on with uh, mounting some of the stuff onto that. I think the first thing to do is probably to mount the uh, two line eight N. So we'll take that. I've got some screws and I've also got some little uh, standoffs. I've cut out a little bits of plastic pipe as I've done before from an old uh, soap dispenser. Soap dispensers, never throw them away. There's a nice pipe inside you can use for this stuff. So we'll do that. And uh, there we are, that's now on top. I just said I had to reverse my uh, decision there to put the screws in from the top. That simply wasn't going to be easy to get at, but that's, that's worked. Now I need to fit the pie on the back. And uh, there we are, we've got the pie on the back of it. This is going rather well, isn't it? This is nice, nice and sturdy. We now need to put this on top of uh, here. But before we can do that, we have to take off this panel. Before we can do that, we have to take out the batteries. And uh, there we are, we're now doing rather well, aren't we? The one thing I've just noticed is I have made a fundamental error here because I've somehow ended up with my switch on the wrong side. My switch here is supposed to be going through this hole and of course it wants to be on this side for the switch. So I'm gonna to have to go and make a, a quick uh, extra bit of drilling there to make that actually fit in, or maybe it, maybe I'll extend that wire out. But one way or the other, I need to do something about making the switch work. But uh, once I've done that, um, this is pretty much going to work, isn't it? And we can take the battery, hopefully, and slide it down into there, and uh, we will have a, a working little robot. And if you're thinking to yourself, why does it overhang so much at the front here? The reason is in the future, in, in, in future videos, I'll be taking some of these photo centers and mounting them under here to make a line following robot. So there's a reason the thing is slightly too large at the front. 
Anyway, I'll now go and sort the switch, and uh, once I've done that, there we are, we'll find we have a mechanically completed robot. And so all I need to do is to wire the thing up, and so I'll do that by the magic of filmmaking. There we are, also wired up, and so I think it's now high time to try and test this thing out. So, here we are, the moment of truth. I've got the robot all wired up, the Pi is powered up. It's still connected to a monitor by HDMI because I've had to run the code, so I'll get rid of its HDMI lead. There we are. The uh, robot is now fully autonomous, and if I switch the switch to turn on the uh, power to the motors, in theory, I can take our Rai keyboard, and if I press a button, yes, the robot works. Drive it back and forth, and stop, and spin, and spin. Marvellous, it works. It's, uh, it's doing what it should. Isn't that great? Forward, stop. It's going to try and come and hit me. Now, what I've also done is something just to remind us what we've got here isn't just a situation where a particular key runs a particular motor. We're actually running code. So I programmed a little sequence onto the D key. If I press that, it runs a little sequence. Let's do that again. The D key, it's a little dance. And of course, the way I've done that is I've simply gone to the code. I've added at the front of the code, import time. So we actually have got the time function available. And then lower down in the code, I've added a section where if we press the D key, it operates a set of um, commands where we're turning on and off different GPIO pins, setting them true and false, and then waiting for periods of time between them. So that gives us the opportunity to do this and do a nice little dance with our Raspberry Pi Zumo robot. Do you like that robot? Yes, I think it's a very happy little robot. It's a very happy robot indeed. I'm really pleased with the way that my Raspberry Pi Zumo robot has come out thus far, not least because it provides a great platform for doing even more exciting things in future videos. If you want to access the code I've used in this video, you can go to the link in the video description for the web page for this project, where you can access the code and the wiring diagram and all the things like that. But now that's it for this time. If you've enjoyed this video, please press the like button. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe and I hope to talk to you again very soon.